in the first lecture, I inter introduced to you 2D QD form DMLs. In the second lecture, I introduced to you the super conformal index of uh, SU2 gauge theory with four flavors. I didn't tell you, I haven't told you the precise relationship between the two. And this precise relationship is the topic of today's uh, lecture. So just to remind you about what we did at the last minute of my last talk, I rewrote the horrible expressions for the superconformal index of SU2 with four flavors. Here it is in its full glory. So it's a product of tons of infinite products, but it's a bit too complicated, right? And in fact, uh, Rastelian collaborators wrote it down in the summer of 2009, and they already noticed that this is related to some kind of 2D Yamil's theory at that point, but it took them two years to find out exactly how the correspondence goes. So after two years of struggle, they found the crucial simplification, which was to take uh, Q equals T. So why was this so <laughs> uh, difficult to find? Well, uh, as I answered you, uh, some, some, some one person in the audience, uh, so these P, Q, T are the fugacities or the exponential chemical potentials of the superconformal generators, which commutes with the chosen supercharge, capital Q and capital Q dagger, but there are no intrinsic nice bases in it. So they are just three-dimensional. You can take whatever uh, basis of it. So Rastelli et al. was using various different conventions, bases, vectors, in every paper of theirs. So in the first few years, their papers are very, very confusing to read for me. <laughs> but after two years, they found the correct basis, which is very nice. So this is PQ equal T. So let's see what happens. For example, so, ah, so I should say that uh, this is the uh, Gaiotto's notation for the S duality of SU2 with NF, NF equals four. So let me quickly remind you that this half corresponds to NF equals two, uh, which is a tri-fundamental chiral multiplet, right? So they transform as a doublet of SU2A, doublet of SU2B, and doublet of SU2G. Similarly for this. In the SDO side, uh, the combination of the flavor symmetries are exchanged. Therefore, uh, we should see some kind of invariance of the superconformal index. And the superconformal index of this side is written here. So <laughs> these three terms correspond to the contributions from the gauge multiplet SU2. This has eight infinite products. This corresponds to the contribution from the left-hand side, tri-fundamental. And the last one is the tri-fundamental contribution for the right-hand side. So the equality you expect, that is mathematically proven, and I showed you mathematical computation last time, is that this is equi uh, invariant under the exchange of uh, uh, B and D, say. Right? So how, how do we see that? Yeah, you're right. Yeah, there are also <laughs> another duality frame. That we're... Anyway, so let's set this to this particular component, right? So what happens is that if you consider PQ, uh, T one half of Z, uh, this becomes, well, I just plug this in one minus uh, T inverse Z. But now we are putting this, right? So, so we have, so I should have write Q here, right? So this combines in this form, and this is inverse, <coughs> and uh, you have also this contribution. But you see that in this 
combination because it is a hypermultiplet, always a fugacity and its in inverse conjugate appear together. So there, there's an additional factor of Z inverse, which is basically this, but inverse are placement of the exponents are reversed. So you immediately see that this part of the infinite product and this part of the infinite product almost completely cancels, right? The only difference between this and that is that here the product runs from zero to infinity. Here the product runs from one to infinity. So there's an almost complete cancellation. And therefore what happens is that this product is just a single infinite product where it might not look like much of a simplification, but nonetheless it's a simplification, right? Much better. So um, here I explicitly did the computation, but it is a general property of n equals to super conformal index that if you set q equals to t, p dependence automatically drops out. This is due to the uh, enhancement of the supersymmetry preserved by the... Ah, yeah, that's... I, I can remind you, but that's not <laughs> going to help you much. Um, so the definition was that uh, super conformal index is something like minus beta q q dagger p uh, j2 plus j1 minus 2r and q is j2, j1 minus 2r, and t was i3 minus r over 2. So this is, this is a funny combination. And uh, whatever that is, uh, we are setting q, t to be q. So what happens is that um, there's only one combination here. So this becomes q's uh, j2. Uh, j1 plus i3 minus r, right? So, well, you need to do the computation of the super conformal algebra a bit carefully, but you can rewrite this into epsilon minus beta prime, q prime, q dagger prime in this particular case, and check that this linear combination of the super conformal Carlton algebra element commutes not just with q, q dagger, but also with this Q prime and Q prime dagger. Therefore, uh, using the standard argument of the invariance of the Witte index, this SCI is not only invariant under the change of beta, but also by uh, the change of beta prime. That's why I said there are twice supercharged preserved in the background, and that's why Q, a P dependence automatically drop out. Thank you for the question. Right. So let's see what kind of simplification we have. So there will not much simplification, you might say, but uh, it is in fact quite significant. So just as I told you, oops, hmm? no, 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 this part, this will become plus minus plus minus plus minus n over zero and one n plus one half uh, z plus minus a plus c plus minus d plus minus inverse and uh, so I'm going to erase and this part becomes similarly yeah maybe I shouldn't bother writing all of the equations here but sometimes doing this computation very explicitly helps you understand what is going on. 
So these are the contributions from the matter fields, and there are contributions from the uh, vector multiplet. So they become a certain term of this form, which I write as one half, again, dz over t two pi i z, uh, one over z squared, one over z two squared inverse, and kz uh, inverse squared, where kz is still an <coughs> infinite product. So <laughs> kz here. Uh, inverse is this following, again, single infinite product. So what do we get by the simplification? So here is the crucial step. This infinite product is the matter contribution. But there is a formula which rewrites this into an infinite sum instead of an infinite product. So let me write it down. So plus minus, plus minus, plus minus. And over all positive and non-negative integer. Uh, Z plus minus, A plus minus, B plus minus. It's really horrible. But uh, this can be rewritten as the following uh, way. K, so this same K, but without minus one. Kz, Ka, Kb, divided by K, K naught, which I introduced shortly and sum is over uh, in positive integers, and chi n, q one half, chi n a, a chi n z, chi n a, chi n b. Uh, you might be familiar with this expression. Haven't you seen this, something like this a few days ago? So I'm not going to give you the proof of this equation, but uh, you can prove this equation by just checking where the poles are on both sides of the equations very carefully. Ah, and I should say that chi n a is just n minus one plus n minus three plus da 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 plus a one minus n. So this is the uh, character of the element A, A inverse in SU2 in the irreducible n-dimensional rep of SU2. So this is the equation. And finally, I need to tell you what this K0 is. The K0 inverse is just a, well, infinite product like this. So, now I'm going to plug this in to this formula. So let me erase this uh, general case, which is very long and uh, hard to re remember. So I'm just going to rewrite this using that expression very explicitly. So let's move very slowly so that you can take the notes if some of you are taking notes. Kz inverse, and I plug in that expression. Kz, Ka, Kb over K0, uh, summation over n, uh, chi n z, chi n a, chi n b over chi n uh, q one half. And again, we have uh, yeah, this is a horribly complicated, but uh, 
you just need to be patient. <laughs> you have kz, kc, kd divided by k0 and summation over, let's use different in index m, which is over one of chi mz, chi mc, chi md divided by chi m q to one half. So now, why is this good? This is good because the dependence on z is localized in the expression. I mean, the only place z appears are here, and this kz inverse, kz here, chi n, and kz there, and chi m, right? Now, kz cancels out, because here you have minus two, this is plus one, this is also plus one. Now, the only z-dependent factor is just this, this, and that. But there's a certain formula of this form. Chi and z, chi and z. This is just chronic delta. This is because uh, this is just a uh, uh, measure induced on the Carlton uh, torus of SU2, and this, these are the characters. So this is just the orthogonality of the characters. This means that in this horrible expression, the only remaining term is where n and m are equal. So you can just perform the integration very explicitly, and the final answer is Ka, Kb, Kc, Kd, divided by K0 squared times summation over all integer, positive integers Uh, and you have k and a, sorry, chi and a, chi and b, chi and c, chi and d, divided by chi and q inverse squared. So now in this form, the invariance under the exchange of a b and d is completely manifest. In fact, the complete symmetry under A, B, C, D is manifest. And if you remember the content of the first lecture of mine, you recognize this as exactly the partition function of Q deformity and melt on a four punctured well, torus, sorry, sphere with holonomy variable given by A, B, C, D but with the area sent to zero. Uh, please remember in your note, I mean in the first lecture, the summation is of this form, A and quadratic Casimir of the representation times chi, 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 things like that. Here we don't see anything like that. So you need to set A to zero. So this is the zero area limit of Q deformed to the young males. And as I already told you, uh, there can be some strange renormalization factors involved. And indeed, we see that associated to the uh, Euler number here, and also due to a strange, um, from the 2D point of view, strange normalization of the measure on the SU2 manifold. But this is exactly uh, the partition function of Q young males up to this bulk renormalization and the wave function renormalization. So this is the explicit uh, for the 2D correspondence I just, I, I wanted to show you. And this is very explicit. So that's the good thing. I mean, better think about this S3 times S1 uh, case compared to the S4 case. 
So for five years ago, when I gave this lecture in the spring school at, here at Rieste, uh, I talked about the case of S4 partition function. In that case, you need to compute conformal blocks, which is very complicated. And uh, on the other side, you need to compute necklace of partition function, which is also very complicated. And you cannot see the full equality. You cannot just prove the, f yeah. Pardon? That's right, that's right. Um, well, this depends on a very explicit embedding of SU2s into SO8. So I, I don't think you can see what happened to the other SU2s. Well, was that your question? Right. Right, um, that's right. So, in this sense, in that sense, um, with this expression, we only see that uh, SU2A times SU2B times dot dot times SU2D within SO8 are properly permuted under this duality, but uh, because SU2 to the fourth is a maximal rank subgroup of SO8, by checking that, you automatically guarantee that all of the SO8 uh, act correctly to, to the fugacities A, B, C, D. Yeah. But that's indirect. So, uh, yeah. So why is this the case? So the, reason, so the rest of my talk today will be spent to explain why this is the case. Simone last week told you that answering why is often a very <laughs> difficult question, but uh, in this case I try. So why is this the case? So this picture is already something is suggestive about this relation, right? So the natural thing you try is that somehow this trivalent vertex corresponding to the uh, tri-fundamental field corresponds to three punctured sphere. Similarly on this side. And there's some connecting tube. So this will correspond to the QGCD here. And this should correspond to SU2 gauge field. <clears throat> so the reason behind this correspondence is basically that There is a certain six dimensional uh, n equals two comma zero SCFT and uh, labeled by G, which is either a n or d n or e n. So this is S U n plus one, and this is S O two n, right? And n is uh, six seven eight such that such that its uh, compactification on S1 in the IR is given by uh, 5D n equals two, a uh, super young mouse with a gauge group 
G. And I'm going to describe how uh, instead of compactifying on S1, if you compactify the same theory of type A1 or type SU2 on this three punctured sphere, you get this four dimensional hypermultiplet Q ABG. And if you compactify that on this tube, you get N equals two vector multiplet. And similarly with the other three punctured sphere. But the basic fact is much more deep that there is this nice something in 60. So before getting to the uh, physical content of this statement, uh, how do we know this fact? So you need to use string theory at this point, uh, pr existence proof. And I need to put the quote around the proof. But the existence proof is that uh, put, if you, you consider n m fibrates on top of each other, and takes the low energy limit, and this gives you the uh, 60 n equals 2 gamma 0 theory of type uh, a n minus 1. And you can do some similar construction with dn and en too. So, pardon? Ah, you need to use type 2b in the en case. So if you think that super string theory and M theory exists, then that already guarantees the existence of uh, this six-dimensional theory. But in the rest of my talk, I don't use much else about string theory or M theory except for this particular fact. This particular fact is very uh, powerful in deducing various properties in 4D. So before getting to discuss what this fact tells us about uh, for the n equals two field theory, I'd like to first discuss for the n equals four theory. When did I start? Uh, 20, okay. So I have a lot of time. So let's start from the 60 theory, which is a super conformal field theory. Let's put it on some S1 of radius R6. And from this fact, we know that this is 5D n equals 2, a super Young Mills with gauge group G. So at infrared, you can write the Lagrangian of this form, G5 squared, trace F mu nu, F mu nu, plus lots of super partners. So what this gauge coupling uh, would be? In five dimensions, this is dimension four, and this is dimension one. The original SCFT doesn't have any mass scale. Therefore, the only sensible thing to write down is that this G5 squared is proportional to R6. I will fix the coefficient later. Let's do another compactification on a circle of radius five. And this becomes 4D n equals four super Young mills with again G as the gauge group. And what would be the gauge coupling constant in this case. This can be seen in a following way. So as is usual in the Kalter Klein expansion, you decompose this five-dimensional integral 
into the integration along the five direction and the rest of the four dimensional integral. And uh, you have this G5 squared trace F mu nu, F mu nu, plus dot, dot, dot. But this total combination is the one over G4, I mean four dimensional Yamil's coupling squared. And uh, if you compactify on a circle of R5, size R5, this will give you a factor of R5. So this is roughly of the order R5 over R6, right? So this is what you get. So what we did is to put the uh, 6D theory on a torus, so you identify the opposite size to get the torus of size R6 and R5. And we obtained for the N equals four super young mills with where coupling constant R5 over R6. But remember, we made a choice of first compactifying along this R6 direction and then did the compactification along R5. You can, of course, switch the order. So if you compactify first on R5 and then R6, you can repeat exactly the same argument and conclude that this is 4D, n equals 4, super ion melts, with coupling, which is instead of R5 over R6, which is R6 over R5. So these two coupling constants are inverse to each other. So this is the s-duality of the n equals 4 super ion mills. This is a really surprising thing about this simple postulate or fact. So s-duality in four dimensions is a very non-trivial operation. However, from this six-dimensional point of view, it is really just a part of Lorentz symmetry, Lorentz invariance, exchanging the two sides of the torus. Uh, and in the first, sorry, in the second lecture, I told you that uh, S-duality exchanges W bosons and monopoles. And how does that arise in this setup? So, uh, in, is there a colored chunk? Uh, yeah. Yeah. P pardon? What guarantees that this symmetry is also the symmetry of the color supply mode on the deduction? Um, so I will talk about the color supply modes. So that's part of the postulate. So this fact includes the behavior about the KK modes too. Yeah. So the 6D theory has a string-like excitation. So in four-dimensional theory, uh, basic excitations are point-like, right? Particles. Here you have strings, and if you have strings on T2, that can either wrap this direction or wrap the other direction, or if you prefer, you can wrap in various other directions too. But let's just consider these two cases. And uh, let's say if you are in a I, I didn't explain, but uh, if you go to the non generic point on the moduli space of the sp supersymmetric vacuum, these strings are tension full. So these are massive strings. Then this excitation looks like a point from the four dimensional point of view. And the mass in 4D will be tension times. R5, of course, right? This string excitation wrapping around this cycle will have different mass, which is given by the same tension times R6. So the ratio of the mass of the excitations ratio of the mass of the excitation is exactly given by this tau, or tau inverse, depending on your point of view. 
And I, please remember, recall that in the last lecture I told you that in n equals 4 super by mills, uh, the ratio of the mass of the W boson and the monopoles are given by this coupling constant tau. So you identify W bosons as this guy and monopoles as the other guy. So W boson and the monopole come from uh, the same object in 60. So this is an interesting point. Uh, many people try to write down a nice useful Lagrangian for this 6D n, n equals 2 comma 0 theory in uh, six dimensions. But uh, suppose somebody finds such a Lagrangian, which is very useful. But then, four-dimensional SDRity of n equals 4 super mills will become completely trivial. The 4D SDRity exchanges uh, perturbative excitations, like W bosons, with almost semi-classical excitations, like monopoles. But they should be completely manifest if you have a completely nice Lorentz invariant Lagrangian in six dimensions. That shows that writing down such a Lagrangian would be extremely hard. This doesn't tell, tell you that it's impossible, but I think it's very, very hard. So let me come to this analysis of Kalsa Klein modes. There's another peculiarity of this relation between the 6D theory and the 5D theory. So before getting to the peculiarity, let's recall what's the standard behavior under S1 compactification. So let's say you have, let's just consider a very simple case of free massless scalar. Phi in capital D dimensions. And let's put it on S1 of radius R. And I guess everyone has learned somewhere that in that case you can decompose this D-dimensional field in terms of the Fourier modes, which depends on the D, uh, D minus one dimensional uh, directions and the exponential I N X D over R. And when this is massless, these component fields phi of N will have mass given by N over R So this is called the Kalta Klein Tower. Right? So ah, so in this fact I'm just erasing, what do we exactly mean about Kalta Klein towers? So, interesting thing is the following. Just consider 5D uh, n equals to a uh, super young mills with gauge group G uh, on a flat space. So it has four dimensional flat space-like direction times the time. And as you know, super young mills has an instant on configuration. So it's a solitonic configuration of the gauge field, which is point-like along R4, but in five dimensions, this extends along the time. So, so using the word instant on is a bit mis- Normal, ox oxymoronic here, but uh, so this becomes instanton particle. 
So it's a particle-like excitation. The mass is given by the action in the four-dimensional sense of the instanton. So uh, if the instanton number is n, the mass is in the standard convention 8 pi squared over g5 squared times n. And using this relation, this is proportional to n over r6. So the mass of the Kautzak-Klein, sorry, mass of the instanton particles behave exactly like the mass of the Kautzak-Klein towers. In fact, assuming that they are indeed Kautzak-Klein towers, you can fix the relation between g5 and r6 by just demanding the equality. So from this analysis, you can fix the proportionality coefficient here. R6 is, sorry, g, g, g squared 5d is 8 pi squared R6. So what does that mean? Uh, usually, if you consider a lower dimensional theory coming from higher dimensional theory under compactification, you need to add Kautzak-Klein towers in the lower dimensional description. But however, in this particular case, from 60 to comma zero theory down to 5D super Yamilt, at least some part of the Kautzak-Klein towers is already included in the five-dimensional Young Mills. That's a surprising uh, fact. And there is an empirical fact. Here. As far as BPS quantities are concerned, and supersymmetric quantities concerned. 5D super Young melt co computation, including instantons, give, gives uh, gives all the KK modes, expected KK modes. So there are many impressive computations of five-dimensional gauge theory using instanton counting. And if you look at the final result, without adding KK modes by hand, the final partition function looks like 6D theory put on S1. In particular, if you add, say, KK towers of 5D Young Mills fields, you get the wrong answer. You get double counting. I don't know why um, at the current level of my understanding, <laughs> this is as much as I can say. So this is an empirical fact. So, so this puzzled many people. But again, this means that writing down six-dimensional 2 comma zero theories Lagrangian in a manifestly Lorentz invariant way is an extremely hard business. Because suppose you have such a six-dimensional Lagrangian. Let's compactify that on S1 and do the analysis like that. 
you always expand six-dimensional fields in the Fourier modes, and then you have tons of KK modes in the Lagrangian. But the computations people have done so far, at, at least as far as the BPS quantities are concerned, means that you shouldn't have those KK modes. So therefore, if you have a 60 fully Lorentz invariant Lagrangian, then that Lagrangian should have a huge new type of gauge symmetry, which should gauge away those KK modes and transform them into the instantons of the zero modes. Um, I'm not saying that it's impossible, but I think it's really hard. Um, so there, I know there are many colleagues of mine who is trying to find the six-dimensional 2 comma zero theory Lagrangian. Please uh, continue the hard work. I, I really love to be surprised. Um, honestly speaking, before ABJM theory came, I felt in a similar way about the Lagrangian of the M2 brain theory. Everybody thought that it's almost impossible to write down a useful Lagrangian describing multiple M2 brains. I mean, maybe most of the students here are too young to remember what surprise, what shock it was when ABGM theory or bagger lambert theory first appeared. But uh, that was a shock. So if some of you write down the Lagrangian of six-dimensional theory, I would be the first one to use that to localization to get something interesting out of that. So please, uh, please do the hard work. Yeah. Yes. Can you use that for localization? Yeah. Yeah, it should, it should be doable. So in the Abelian case, something is strange, right? Uh, in, in the Abelian gauge theory, you don't have this instant on. So there is no contradiction about having an Abelian Lagrangian in 6D. In that case, there's no instant on in 5D U1 gauge theory. So it's perfectly OK, and it's perfectly necessary that you have KK towers if you reduce 6D Abelian self-dual 2 comma 0 theory Lagrangian down to 5D. It's necessary. That said, if you turn on a non commutativity a bit, then there is something called non-commutative instantons, even in the U1 case. So in that case, you can compute the partition function of 5D and equals to super Yamils with U1 gauge group, including the uh, non-commutative instantons. Surprisingly, that computation exactly reproduces the standard U1 Jan Mills computation plus all of the KK modes. They are equivalent. So there are nice papers showing that, not only on R4, but on a general, uh, more general four manifolds. So there seems to be really a kind of gauge symmetry which can transform a KK tower into instantons of the zero modes. At least for the U1 case, this was done very explicitly. I mean, we don't know what the symmetry is, but you can write down both sides and compute it in the both sides, and you get the same answer. So it seems to be working. So the problem is how to realize that with non abelian G. Any questions? Yeah. Pardon? Ah. Um, in this case, there is no churn simons term. Um, if, you have, well, if you want to have n equals 1 super Yamils in five dimensions, it's compatible with churn simons terms. But with this maximal supersymmetry, you cannot have churn simons term in 5D. But uh, these days, we are slowly generalizing this relation between 6D and 5D. And now we know that we can start from 61 comma zero theory and compactify it down to uh, n equals one 5D theory. And in that case, Chan Simon's term uh, plays an important role. Yeah. All right. So uh, um, this is the discussion for n equals four. And let me just finish my talk today by discussing the n equals two case. So, yeah.
So let's take six dimensional two comma zero theory of type A1 or SU2 and put it on this type of surface. Ah, so I, I forgot to say that I often say that 60 2 comma 0 theory is of type G, but I do not mean that there is a gauge field with gauge group G in six dimensions. I do not mean that. So nobody is sure what is going on in 60. Um, if there is something, there will be some kind of non Abelian two form field. So there's definitely not the standard gauge field. So let me just stress that you need to always say it's just type A1, not gauge group A1, but whatever. Let's put six dimensional two comma zero theory of type A1 on this kind of Riemann surface, a two dimensional surface. So these two parts are rather complicated, but let's just consider the cylindrical part. So let's say this direction is, has length R6, and these two parts have something like length R5, right? So if you look at this part, just this part closely, what you find is something like this. R, so this is R6, this is R5, and something is going on around here. Some, something is going on on the two sides. Let's use the fact that if you compactify 6D theory on a circle, you get five-dimensional superior melt. So this is equivalent to having a 5D superior melt on a segment of length R5 coupled to something here, coupled to something there, right? And the uh, gauge coupling constant was like R, one of R6. Therefore, if you go further down to four dimensions, this is 4D gauge multiplet with tau given by roughly like R5 over R6. So that's what you get. Here you have this maximally supersymmetric 5D mills on a segment but you have something going on at the boundary. So there can be many things going on at the boundary, but uh, you cannot keep the full supersymmetry uh, on this setup. At most, you can do, what you can do is to keep half of the supersymmetry. And suppose you are doing that by carefully choosing the metric here or the R symmetry background here, which I don't have time to discuss, but let's assume that there is a half of the supersymmetry preserved. So this is, originally we started from n equals two 5D superior mills, but remaining for the gauge multiplet is one half of it. So it's n equals two uh, vector multiplet due to the boundary condition. So what is this boundary condition? Uh, from the 60 point of view, you cannot really say directly what exactly is this boundary condition, but uh, there's one nice class of boundary condition in 5D super and mills, which is that, which is the following. You realize that this boundary, boundary is R4, right? So you can have you can have some 4D uh, theory with SU2 flavor symmetry here. Living on the boundary that couples to the bulk.
to the bulk. So there's some theory here and there coupled to this SU2 uh, gauge multiplet. At this point, there's not much, there, I don't know how to directly argue that this theory, which should be there, the boundary, is this uh, tri-fundamental hypermultiplet, A, B, G, and uh, G, C, D. But at least you can see a rough structure emerging just by the basic fact. So let's try to determine exactly this three point three punctured sphere is from the six D perspective. To do that, let's consider the superconformal index of this system. So please pretend that the final answer uh, is not yet known, right? And let's just consider the superconformal index of for this theory obtained by putting 6D theory on this, right? What was the SCI? SCI is trace of H, trace over the S3 Hilbert space minus one to the F times, well in this, in the particular choice of the variable that was basically something like this and various flavor fugacities. So this was the Hamiltonian way of writing down the SCI, but if you think of Q as exponential of beta, this is essentially partition function of the system on S3 times S1, where the length of the time, -like, time, time direction is beta or log Q with some additional chemical potential put in. So let's apply this to this six-dimensional theory. So what is this SCI of this 4D theory? This is a partition function of the 6D theory on S3 times S1 times this thing. By definition, now you realize that there is a S1, which proves to be very useful. Here we invoke the fact. The 6D theory on S1 is equal to the 5D theory. So you get 5D theory on S3 times this Riemann surface. Right? Now, this 5D theory has a Lagrangian. So this is something you can really compute. And there are brave people who really computed this partition function. But rough, roughly, you can see what's going on. This is just 5D super young mills on S3. So basically, you should get some version of 2D young mills on this Riemann surface, right? Plus corrections that come from the fact that you have this S3 of a finite size. And after employing the localization along this S3, which is exactly like what Marcos told you last week. So in that case, what was done is to reduce three-dimensional supersymmetric theory down to zero-dimensional non-supersymmetric matrix model. Philosophically, you do the same reduction from supersymmetric one down to non-supersymmetric matrix model point-wise on the Riemann surface. 
So you get from starting from five-dimensional supersymmetric meals down to two-dimensional non-supersymmetric meals, and then there are lots of corrections coming from the KK KK modes around this one, sorry, around S3, and people have confirmed that these corrections exactly gives you the Q deformed Young Mills. So just by starting from this uh, general feature, general fact that the 6D theory in question on S1 becomes the 5D super Young Mills, you can compute the super conformal index of this 4D theory without knowing exactly what it is. So here I'm using the computation in the logically backward order in some sense. So starting from 60, you do this computation and this has a certain explicit form as a Q Young Mills. But by looking at that, you can read off exactly what is the superconformal index of say, well, let's just consider the superconformal index of this three punctured sphere. So if you follow that argument, the SCI of this thing has this infinite sum form, KKK over K0, chi, chi, chi over chi. But you realize that this can be re re rewritten as an infinite product showing that it is the tri-fundamental uh, hypermultiplet. So that's how you see just from the basic feature of the six-dimensional theory that it becomes 5D super Young Mills that uh, 6D theory on the three punctured sphere is the tri-fundamental hypermultiplet. So, so now that we know that uh, S duality can be derived in a nice way, so I don't know where to erase, the, so I will finish. So now we are pretty sure that this compactification of the 6D theory gives you tri-fundamental and another tri-fundamental coupled by this vector multiplet. And uh, I, unfortunately I erased, ah, I didn't erase. Coupling constant is this, and this is one over G squared. So the coupling is very weak when this cylinder is very long. Let's make it very strong, right? So slowly you try to merge these two things and make this tube very, very short. In that limit, you can instead split uh, the 2D surface in a different way. So this is a strongly coupled limit. Now you consider the dimensional reduction along this direction, and then you see that there's dual SU2 emerging coupled to dual Q fields. So that's how you see the n equals 2 SU2 S duality from six-dimensional point of view. Thank you very much. <laughs>